Good morning, dear friends. As I had told you, I am going to talk about Philip Larkin's poem once today. I welcome you to this session. Philip Larkin's poem once was first published in the very slim pamphlet that Larkin published in 1951, entitled 20 Poems. Once was republished, reprinted in Less Deceived in 1955. Now, today we are going to read the poem once. But before we do that, we will tell you to do certain things. First of all, look at the title once. It is in plural form. So it may mean what we lack, what, do we, what we don't have. So I want a wing or I want a pair of wings. I don't have them. Similarly, it can also mean what we wish to have. I want to become a successful teacher, for example. So, two possible meanings of the word once, maybe, if we consider the word to be a noun in this context, it may mean what we don't have and what we wish to have, want to have. There is another possibility also. Apparently a bit far-fetched, it may also mean in Larkin's very, very self-conscious, elliptical, linguistic bend of mind, it can also mean the third person singular present form of the word or the verb want. I want it, you want it, but he wants it or she wants it. So in a way, it may mean what somebody, anybody, or everybody wants. Why am I actually talking about this possible interpretation of the title will become somewhat clearer when we read the poem. So much for the title for the time being. Let us now look at the poem's text. See, if you can see the poem, if you have the text with you, what do you see? Correct me if I am wrong. The first and the fifth line of the first stanza are identical. Yes or no? Yes, sir. Okay. The second, the third, and the fourth line of the first stanza begins with the word however. Yes or no? Yes, yes sir. Go to the second stanza. The first and the fifth line of the second stanza, again, are identical. Yes? 
yes look sir. at the second stanza yes again so far as the three intervening lines of the second stanza are concerned that means line 7 8 and 9 if you look at them two of them start with the word the t h e yes or no yes sir okay what does the other line start with well the first word of the seventh line is despite sir despite the first word of the eighth line is the the life sir the 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 first word of the ninth line is the the so you will see that have even though philip larkin is using no rhyme in these lines there is a kind of a pseudo rhythm pseudo rhythm a kind of a rhythm an apparent rhythm is actually created by the use of repetitions sometimes phrases are repeated sometimes in sometimes entire lines are repeated sometimes words are repeated and there is also a use of alliteration okay now look at the individual stanzas the stanzas are basically quintains or quintets q u i n t a i n s or q u i n t e t s five line stanzas check five line stanzas and in this particular poem what larkin has done is he has used parallelism by repeating the first line in the last line of the stanza and by sandwiching the intervening lines 2 3 and 4 on the, uh, in the case of the first stanza and 7 8 and 9 in the case of the second stanza by sandwiching the intervening lines in between the repeated lines he is cre- creating a rhetorical and a poetic effect both in the, in the, at the same time okay now we will go innovative for the sake of our convenience we will start reading the poems we will start reading the poem but in a particular way Shubhashri will now read out the first stanza, but she will not read the first line. She will start from the second line. Shubhashri. Yes, sir. However, the sky grows dark with invitation cards. However. we follow the printed directions of sex however the family is photographed under the flag staff beyond all these the wish to be alone okay okay cut out the words however cut out the words however read the second line without however the sky darkens the sky. with invitation the sky. invitation cards yes 
गोन सर विदाउट यस नो नो विदाउट हाउ एवर द स्काई डार्क यस ग्रोस डार्क द स्काई ग्रोस डार्क विद इनविटेशन कार्ड्स इनविटेशन कार्ड्स यस ग्रोस डार्क विद इनविटेशन कार्ड्स now it is a poetic very poetic way of saying that there are always invitation cards there are always requests and demands from our friends and familiar ones for our company we are always told to go somewhere or to do something that is basically what these each of the invitation cards actually boils down to why does the time important why is the time important why is the darkening of the sky important it may very easily be the onset of evening we are reminded of t.s eliot's characteristic poetic trick of starting the poem in the time of evening now the sky can also mean it may in, in symbol the poet's mind we always have things to do places to go miles to go before we sleep but it is a taxing proposition because today in the 21st century even our psychiatrists are telling us to wind down sometimes to get away from the hustle and bustle of everyday social life and to spend time with one's own self okay that's the third line without however read it we follow the printed directions of sex we follow the printed directions of sex so if in the preceding line there is a second line or we were talking about our friend or friends now we are talking about our individual partners sexual partners spouses whatever so we follow the printed directions of sex since the world has lost much of its charm and meaning even sex has become drab dreary it has lost its charm so we only follow mechanically we follow the printed directions of sex by way of historicizing we may say that in the late 1940s and in the early 1950s just after the second world war there was a generation in great britain which was called the baby boomers at that time the birth rate actually increased drastically <coughs> and you know much research was done in the field of fertility treatment and medicine now printed directions of sex 
means it is programmed and it is done as a matter of course because philip larkin has often sarcastically described sex and sex with love okay let's go to the fourth line without however the family is photographed under the flag stuff okay so first there were the friends then there were the partners spouses wives husbands and so on and so forth now comes the family reinforcing my reference to the baby boomers you know the family is photographed under the flag stuff now in a way it has got a patriotic undertone to this line you know the flag stuff is the symbol of the country and it also symbolizes patriotism so if you actually photograph your family if you take a photo of your family and the flag stuff or flag pole it may be considered as a patriotic gesture but it is it is only gesture going to parties having sex or spending time with the family everything has lo uh, has lost its charm its meaning its value why now read the fifth line beyond all these the wish to be alone so beyond socializing beyond sex and, and beyond family engagements there is always the wish to be alone who wishes it is it the speaker is he the veritable every man that is the konandra that is the mystery of the poem that we have to solve now let's read the first line which is the fifth line all over again you know reversely speaking so beyond these preoccupations beyond all our worldly preoccupations there is always a wish to be alone this statement begins the poem in a very elliptical way as if beyond this this may mean all our worldly preoccupations taken together now let us probe the word however however may mean we all know it may mean two things number one however may mean howsoever in any possible way in any possible way we do it however i want to make you understand you are not going to understand so however mean may mean at least in any way possible it also has a tendency to mean something else it may mean despite everything 
so if we now read the first stanza in total without deleting any word any line let's do it chosri beyond all these the wish to be alone however the sky grows dark with invitation cards however we follow the printed directions of sex however the family is photographed under the flag stuff beyond all these the wish to be alone you see we can actually look at this poem from any one of the two possible perspectives at least for the beginners as beginners we can look at it from two perspectives one is to personalize it to lyricize it to consider it as a personal poem indicative of or expressing expressive of the speaker's the poet speaker's wish to be alone this wish to be alone is very very interesting because in every age along with the socializing tendency there is also a tendency of the man to be a recluse we may think about poets such as emily dickinson even our philip larkin was always very shy and retiring even though he wanted publicity he wanted his poems to be read he did not want to give any pub public readings in a way andrew motion has pointed out often times that philip larkin had the propensities of a recluse so this can be a personal poem but at the same time as we all know that the days the milia and the moment also have much to do with the writing of a poem with the making of a poet and because it was published first in 1951 it must have been written sometime either in the late 40s or in the first year of the 1950s just after the second world war so in a way he is actually debunking friendship he is debunking love and sexuality and he is debunking the family so all and and also the country patriotism he is debunking everything so in a way he is debunking all the so called sacred institutions that had held the western life for so long but that were summarily questioned and undermined during the second world war we all know that man was placed in an existential void which led to the writing and staging of the theater of the absurd which led to the birth of extreme forms of existentialism so in a way man is left to fend for himself without the possible cushions of friendship of romantic attachment of family life and so on and so forth in every way since the collective does not support or console each of the human beings he or she 
wants to be alone with himself or herself. I hope the third possible meaning of the word wants in the title has now been reasonably satisfactorily discussed and interpreted. Now, let us go to the second stanza. But before we do that, the dichotomy that Larkin has presented in the first stanza, we may think, we may be clear, is the tussle between the collective and the individual. between society on the one hand and the individual on the other. Let us go to the next stanza now. Okay. Again, do this. Uh, leave out the sixth line and start reading the stanza from the seventh line onwards without leaving anything out. Despite the artful tensions of the calendar, the life insurance, the tabled fertility rights, the costly aversion of the eyes away from death, beneath it all, the desire for oblivion runs. So if the important starter of the argument in the First stanza was, however, then in this case, in the second stanza, it is despite. You see, if in the first stanza the wish was to be alone, then in the second stanza, the desire is for oblivion. To forget. Desire is to forget. How and when can men forget? If he dies. Or if he can be sensorily muted. He can, if he can subtract himself or herself from the surroundings, insulate himself or herself from his surroundings. And what kind of, kind of sur surroundings? Read it again, despite the... Despite the artful tensions of the calendar. Yes, the artful tensions, just wait. Artful tensions of the calendar. Why does the calendar give you tension? Just as the invitation cards reminded you of what you had to do. Similarly, the calendar also reminds you to do things at their proper time. You have to go somewhere, you have to do something. And what kind of things you have to do? Let us think about it. Again, let us go back to the first stanza and correlate to follow the printed directions of sex. To go to the parties, to spend time and to, and to memorialize those moments with the family. Here also, the artful tensions, artful here can mean two things. One, it can mean crafty. It can also mean artificial. Something that is very, very deliberate, 
the result of much labor and planning and something that is much natural okay the artful tensions of the calendar what are those tensions read it go on after that the life insurance the tabled fertility rights the costly aversion of the eyes away from death wait wait wait, wait. these are the things life insurance you have to pay your premium in time on a, on a particular date or else your policy will lapse so it is one of the artful tensions of the calendar then the tabled fertility rights you know i have already pointed out how fertility treatment in the 1950s was becoming very very important now tabled fertility rights may mean medicines again it may also point out in a larger context the programmed way of going about sex and having a family begetting children why these are the costly aversions of the eyes from death in order to ward off the finality of death what do you do if you remember sonnet 17 of shakespeare's you beget children you bring a copy of yourself to this world so that you are remembered even after you are dead otherwise you actually ensure yourself ensure yourself so that i am reminded of the the catch phrase of the um, advertisement of uh, lic of uh, life insurance corporation zindagi ke saath bhi zindagi ke baad bhi with life and after life but these are costly why because one has to do them whether the one to, one wants to do them or not but beneath it all the desire for oblivion runs man has to do all these things man has to take care of all his social familial professional responsibilities but there is always a wish there is always a desire to forget all these things because they give us anui they won't bore us they do not all these preoccupations do not give us sufficient time is that to be ourselves or to be with ourselves now if it can be read as an autobiographical or a personal poem by expressing the innermost thoughts and desires of the reclusive poet then it can also be historicized by pointing out the vacuity beyond and beneath the surface glitter and happiness after the second world war that great britain was going through so in a way 
what this poem does is to give you a chance to interpret a chance to get in uh, under the skin of the poet larkin who was intensely personal and yet keenly alive to the contemporary situation so this was my reading of the poem once by philip larkin if you have any questions you may shoot you may ask me any question that you feel like sir hello sir yes yes sir, the, the poet desi- the poet desires for oblivion sir when on desires for oblivion there must be some uh guilty or something um, something he has done that is bad that uh, that um, irritates him that irritates his peaceful being so he desires for oblivion so why uh, why the poet is here uh, desiring for oblivion is it because he is uh, fed up with the um, uh, with the uh, tabled fertility rights or or the scheduled uh, ongoing of life or is it something else you see the concept of guilt is a very very porous one there is legal guilt there is moral guilt but also there is something called a mental sense of guilt that one feels towards himself when you do not do what you want to do or what you need to do to others you may feel guilty or when you do something that is morally or legally reprehensible you feel guilt but similarly when you cannot do justice to yourself when you cannot satisfy yourself you may also feel a kind of guilt towards yourself this kind of dissatisfaction is very much there in the poem now the thing is critics down the ages have now pointed out to us that there are multiple readings there are possibilities of multiple readings a poem a sentence may mean one thing it may mean other things also so if you try to personalize this poem this wish to be alone this desire for oblivion may refer to philip larkin but if you historicize this poem when was it written where was it written by whom was it written it was written in the early 50s it was written in great britain it was written by philip larkin then obviously the contemporary situation that led toma uh, that that led to the writing of waiting for godot by samuel beckett uh can also be conducive to the writing of 
such a very dense but very short poem as the once it is once okay any any other question well most day if you have the no questions uh, i will just sign off after pointing out that next day i am going to deal with the poem the explosion by philip larkin so before you tune in before you join the class please have the text ready okay sir Okay uh, Shamim you may now remove me